and Mr. Fitz. I care about Rachel, all right? And I'm 18. So with all due respect, I think I'll decide who I see. Are you and Miss Grundy, like, together? He's 17. He's a student. He's in one of your classes. He's your student. That's like a monumental abuse of power. The teacher-student relationship has long been a staple of teen TV. High school students get it on with their teachers, and for a long time people barely batted an eye. Dawson's Creek, Friends, Mean Girls, Gilmore Girls, Gossip Girl, all the girls, Pretty Little Liars, Degrassi, Riverdale, and the Gossip Girl reboot all depict students in relationships with their teachers or professors. From Aria and Ezra to Archie and Ms. Grundy, it feels like the trope is almost impossible to escape. However, recent teen TV has seen the tides shift, as the Me Too movement has altered how we see exploitative and inappropriate relationships both on and off screen. In this video, I want to look at how the teacher-student relationship has evolved in teen TV. The trope pops up in a lot of TV shows, so I'm only going to look at a handful in order to keep this video from getting too long or convoluted. When I was researching this video, I was actually surprised how many shows I'd seen that have this teacher-student relationship trope that I had just completely forgotten about. In Friends, Phoebe's brother Frank has a relationship with and eventually marries his 44-year-old home ec teacher. Ross also later dates one of his college students. In Gilmore Girls, Paris dates her college professor Asher, and Dear White People also shows a student-professor relationship with Troy and Professor Hobbs. Degrassi let me down for the first time when it showed Sav Bandari and Miss O dance around a relationship in his senior year. The trope is so pervasive that it's hard to find a show that's aimed at teens and young adults that doesn't engage with it in some form. I'm going to look in depth at Gossip Girl, both the original and the reboot, Pretty Little Liars, Riverdale, and A Teacher to trace how the portrayal of this problematic relationship has changed. Just to be clear, this relationship is always unacceptable, but it's not always portrayed as such. In order to avoid getting demonetized, I have to really dance around the S-E-X word, so please forgive any censoring or alternative phrases used. I hope that everybody watching this is aware why teacher-student relationships are inappropriate and for the most part illegal, but I'm going to briefly outline why just in case. No matter what the age of consent is in a country or an area, whether it's technically legal or illegal, it is always inappropriate, unethical, and irresponsible for a teacher to have a romantic relationship with their student. The moral implications of a teacher sleeping with their student are severe. It's manipulative, it is predatory, and it is a gross abuse of power. Because of the nature of teacher-student relationships, the teacher acts as a guide figure for the student. They are an educator and a model of behavior for children and teens. They also hold sway over the student's future as they can affect grades, which can affect graduation, college, job prospects, etc. There's often a justification that the student is mature for their age as if that somehow makes it okay, but no matter how intelligent or mature a student is, it is always irresponsible and inappropriate for a teacher to engage with them in non-professional means. The skewed power imbalance undermines any form of consent that the student could provide. There's an implicit threat underneath the relationship that the teacher could make life or school difficult for the student if they don't consent or reciprocate the advances. Also, the nature of teacher-student relationships means that they must be kept secret, which is a staple of any grooming practices. In this recent article on grooming, Aaron Corbett outlines the course of action predators take and the massive impact it has on the well-being of the victims. Abusers will target minors and establish a seemingly positive relationship with them, maybe giving them gifts, saying nice things to them, or just generally providing an emotional support that they may not get from friends or family. Corbett writes, 
Grooming is so insidious because targets of this type of abuse tend to believe that they are involved in a loving relationship with the perpetrator. Often, the targets of the abuse don't realize that the relationship is a violation. In the same article, Jenna Quinn, who is an author and a pioneer in the U.S. child sexual abuse prevention movement, is quoted as saying, Perpetrators often rely on secrecy and threaten many things to ensure the person will not disclose the abuse, and this can lead to feelings of guilt and shame, which can cause delayed reporting. The student may feel like it's their fault if the relationship goes wrong, or they may feel like nobody understands the relationship, like them and the teacher truly love one another. They may fail to recognize how insidious and harmful the relationship was as a result. Just as a side note, I know that student and college professor relationships aren't technically illegal. They happen between seemingly consenting adults, but often the student is still a teenager, be it 18 or 19, and they're engaging with someone who is twice or three times their age. And the skewed power imbalance remains because, again, the professor may affect their grades and their job prospects, etc. So again, it's undermining any consent that the student could provide. In the shows that I talk about in this video, all of the relationships happen between high school students and teachers, but I just wanted to touch on that as a brief little note. Unfortunately, a lot of teen TV that show teacher-student relationships fail to capture the abusive reality of the situation. Instead, it's romanticized and devoid of any nuance or criticism. The portrayals are often aspirational, forbidden romance-type stories instead of cautionary tales, twisting reality into some kind of warped fantasy. Pretty Little Liars is probably the most well-known and problematic portrayal of the student-teacher relationship. It begins in the pilot when Arya meets Ezra at a bar at the end of summer and they sleep together. Arya is like 15 or 16 and Ezra is about 22 at the time. Upon seeing that Arya is his student, Ezra says that he wasn't aware of her age. But even after finding out that she's a teenager, he still maintains a relationship with her. The Pretty Little Liars storylines get increasingly convoluted, but in season four, it's revealed that Ezra was actually writing a book about the disappearance of Arya's friend, Alison. So this means that when he met her in the bar, he knew who she was and he knew how old she was and he still slept with her. The show does a lot of dancing around the age gap and power imbalance over the course of the first season. The couple frequently discuss the inappropriate nature of their relationship, but without doing anything about it. The writers do something called lampshading, which is when you acknowledge an issue or a trope, but continue to use and endorse said trope. So the writers are basically like, yeah, we know this relationship is sketchy, but we're still gonna do it anyways. The relationship is very much on again, off again throughout the entire show, and the Ezria wiki page tracks this extensive history, counting eight separate relationships with affairs and one night stands in between. But throughout all of this, the audience is supposed to root for them to be together. The narrative reunites them time and time again, and even Arya's friends want them to be together. At one point, her friend Hannah dissuades Arya from going to the principal and telling them about their relationship with Ezra, saying, Arya, if you tell Principal Hackett about your relationship, Ezra's not just gonna suffer, he's gonna go to jail. As he should. This man should be in prison. He should be in jail. And they keep just dancing around it and acting as if it would be so sad if he went to prison. Aww. But then, to top it all, the finale of Pretty Little Liars takes place at their wedding. So all the grooming and manipulation culminates in them being together forever. Okay. The portrayal of this relationship is actually sickening. At one point, there's a plot point where Arya almost files a police report detailing her relationship with Ezra, and I didn't watch this far in the show, but I think it's after she found out that he's writing a book about Allison. And in the report, she says that he manipulated her, that he took advantage of their power dynamic in order to keep her quiet. But the writers frame this as if she was just angry and saying these things out of anger, and even she herself says that it was a lie. And if this report had been filed, Ezra would have gone to jail. And maybe this is a hot take, but I think that if people found out about your relationship with your partner and your partner goes to prison, that should probably be like red flag number one. 
But the fact that the writers framed it in this way that they said, Oh no, he didn't abuse his authority, he didn't take advantage of her, and he didn't manipulate Arya, is so irresponsible because he did do all those things. The writers manipulate the audience and the characters into thinking that this relationship is okay, which it absolutely is not. And not only did Ezra prey on Arya, but he also had a relationship with Allison before her disappearance, so he's literally just a full-on predator. Ezra groomed Arya, and no amount of romanticization can overshadow that, but Pretty Little Liars sure does try. Even the marketing pushes the relationship. The showrunner, I, Marlene King, is quoted in interviews that she thinks the pair are soulmates, and Lucy Hale said that she thinks the relationship is super sexy and that the forbidden romance was like Romeo and Juliet. There was even merch sold that was endorsed by the cast and the show that promoted Ezria. All of this really encapsulates the attitude that dominated teen TV in regards to teacher-student relationships. <laughs> Gossip Girl depicts several relationships with huge age disparities and power imbalances. One such relationship is that of Dan and Miss Carr, Constance's English teacher. Miss Carr bounces onto the scene in season two. She's a young new teacher, bright eyed and bushy tailed, with the hopes of touching the hearts of her students. But she ends up touching a lot more than hearts. Her and Dan meet privately off school grounds, which is red flag number one, in order to discuss Dan's writing. Dan expresses an interest in her, but she rejects him. Nevertheless, Blair and Serena start a Gossip Girl rumor that the two are sleeping together, which gets the school board involved, and Miss Carr is temporarily fired. The night of her firing, Dan comes over and they sleep together, but then the next day it's revealed that their relationship was just a rumor, so she's rehired. But at this point, it's no longer a rumor. It's kind of messy, but bear with me. So Dan and Miss Carr continue to sleep together, and they even sleep together on school property at one point, which is just so disgusting. To be fair, Dan's dad, Rufus, does find out about the relationship, and he tries to put a stop to it, but he doesn't. There's more drama because Blair has a vendetta against the teacher and continuously manipulates things in order to make life hard for Miss Carr. And by the end of it, Miss Carr moves away, but she's framed as more of a victim of Blair's wrath than a predator. Dan treats the whole situation as a learning experience and moves on. All of this happens over the course of three episodes, so Gossip Girl really didn't give any time to kind of dive into the intricacies or critique this relationship at all. Granted, Gossip Girl has its fair share of ludicrous and sensational storylines, but its lighthearted brush with the teacher-student relationship shows how early teen TV treated these as like forbidden love storylines rather than warning against grooming and abuse. Gossip Girl is too caught up in the idea of a sexy forbidden romance to critically engage with or even realize what they're portraying, which is a very inappropriate and illegal relationship. <laughs> Riverdale's Archie and Miss Grundy kind of shows a shift in public perception regarding student-teacher relationships. I say kind of because though it romanticizes the relationship, it doesn't end happily. Riverdale really wastes no time in setting up this relationship. In the pilot episode before the title sequence is even played, we see a flashback that shows Archie and Miss Grundy getting hot and heavy over summer. Miss Grundy blatantly objectified and pursued Archie, but despite this, she plays at the moral high ground by attempting to distance herself from Archie and refusing to give him private music lessons. When his friends find out, Archie parts phrases used by victims of grooming, saying that their relationship is legitimate and that they love each other. And you're worried about some, some cougar! Don't call her that! Okay, she's not like that. She cares about me. And the people around Archie really fail to protect him. His friends are more concerned with the fact that he will be going off to college and unable to sustain the relationship rather than being concerned that the relationship even started in the first place. In the fourth episode, Betty's mom, Alice, bursts onto the scene accusing Miss Grundy of being a predator and threatening to have her thrown in prison. But it's revealed that she's more angry at Archie than Miss Grundy, so this is kind of a revenge ploy. And because of that, she lets Miss Grundy go as long as she promises to leave Riverdale. Archie defends her to the very end, but as Miss Grundy is leaving, we see her eyeing up other high school boys. It's clear that she is a blatant predator. In the second season, she's shown kissing yet another boy she's giving private music lessons to, and then she's killed by the Black Hood, who's a serial killer, for being a sinner. 
So though she is ultimately punished, the parents and adults of Riverdale allowed her to continue to prey on young men when they had the chance to arrest her. There is some perverted sense of justice in this storyline, but it's tainted by the fact that we know that she abused several young men and that people could have stopped it. 2020 really saw a turning point in the portrayal of teacher-student relationships. A Teacher and The New Gossip Girl are the first shows I've seen that actually discuss how inappropriate these relationships are. A Teacher claims to explore the complexities and consequences of a student-teacher affair, and it is based off a 2013 film of the same name, written and directed by Hannah Fidel. And unlike the other shows in this video, the relationship of the student and the teacher are the central subject matter of this show, not a side plot. Hi, so as I was editing this, I realized that I called a teacher a teen TV show even though it's technically aimed at a mature audience and I knew that but I think that the subject matter is just so relevant to this video that I didn't want to leave it out and I do think that it helps illustrate how the cultural perceptions around teacher-student relationships are changing. Also Nick Robinson is the star of this show and he had previously been in Everything Everything, Love, Simon, and The Fifth Wave so I think that the producers knew that he was going to lure in some teens. But still, I think my classification of it as a teen show is incorrect, so apologies for that. It's rather just a show about teenagers and probably watched by teenagers, so keep that in mind. The first half of this show establishes the relationship between a teacher, Claire, and her student, Eric, who she tutors for the SATs. Once it gets naughty, there's a lot of graphic bed scenes that are uncomfortably romanticized for the fact that they are portraying. The first half of the show really romanticizes the relationship and I understand that this is to kind of give us Eric's point of view but I don't think that the criticism in the latter half of the show sufficiently counteracts that romanticization. Their relationship is exposed and Claire goes to prison for about six months and Eric goes to college where he's left to grapple with the fact that his relationship was not real love but grooming and manipulation. Their relationship takes place over the course of a few weeks and unfortunately I think the show spends too much time concentrating on those few weeks instead of the aftermath. Afterwards, there's a lot of time jumps that are either months or up to 10 years that show the characters as they've gone on with their life. And because of these time jumps, it prevents the writers from fully exploring Eric's trauma. It just kind of half-heartedly depicts how he makes some reckless decisions and how he struggles with his reputation and his relationship to sex. His high school peers and frat bros congratulate him on his conquest, and there's few people that actually realize how damaging this relationship is. It's not until the final scene that we see Eric actually articulate his feelings and the impact that this trauma has had on his life. Do you know how long I hated myself because I thought that I hurt you? I, mean, I lost years, Claire. And because this takes place in the very final scene, it feels like the writers almost felt like they had to shove in their point because it wasn't fully fleshed out enough over the course of the season, and it almost feels like a last minute addition. Claire, the teacher, plays the victim throughout the entire show, and I understand that Hannah Fidel wanted to explore her character, but I think more attention and screen time should have been paid to Eric. Like, I don't need another, like, naughty scene with Claire, I would rather have seen Eric going to therapy or talking with his mother about his emotions. Claire has her own trauma that she's been working through and she uses that as an excuse and I think the show spends so much time on it that it almost feels like the show's excusing her too. So I don't think the show feels enough like a cautionary tale given the subject matter, though I think it failed in its mission to capture the abuse and the power imbalance, I do think it is a step in the right direction. <laughs> Finally, the Gossip Girl reboot subverted the teacher-student relationship trope of the original through the relationship of Max Wolf and Rafa Caparos. All of the teachers in this show have unhealthy relationships with their students because they are the ones that run Gossip Girl. Spoiler alert, it's in the first episode, but Rafa really takes this to the next level. Over the first couple of episodes, pansexual playboy Max 
pursues Rafa in very direct, inappropriate, and probably illegal ways. He follows him to a sauna, he approaches him in the school showers, and he turns up drunk to his apartment. Max basically stalks and harasses his teacher, Rafa, in order to get him to sleep with him. Initially, Rafa rebuffs him and makes clear that nothing is going to happen, but there's still a flirty undertone to their interactions, and they do make a deal to hook up after Max's graduation. So there's that. However, after Max's home life has been racked by family drama, Rafa gives in and starts sleeping with Max. Aki, Max's friend, finds out and tries to put a stop to the relationship. He realizes that Rafa has taken advantage of Max's fraught mental state, and he tells Rafa that this relationship is inappropriate and that they should end it. Like the other shows I've talked about, this teacher shows clear signs of grooming. He takes advantage of the power dynamic as well as supporting Max in a time of emotional turmoil in order to establish an intimate relationship with him. Aki finds out that Rafa has lied to Max about his past, and Max also finds out that Rafa has previously slept with his senior students. He still likes him young. Still? We f***ed when I was a senior. That's his thing. So Rafa really has a pattern of lowering in vulnerable seniors and gaining their trust in order to sleep with them. So Max breaks it off upon finding this out, but Rafa criticizes Max, saying that Max pursued him. But this completely overlooks the fact that it is Rafa's responsibility to keep that teacher-student boundary in place and to ensure the safety of his students. There is no justification for manipulating and sleeping with them, no matter how persistent they may be. Rafa had the option of going to the principal or going to the police in order to stop Max's advances, but he did neither of those things. By the end, it's clear that Rafa was only playing at taking the moral high ground and had no intention of actually keeping his students safe. Given his history of preying on students, he's a danger to the boys and young men at St. Jude's school. So I really hope that his storyline ends with him in prison. Though these later representations are by no means perfect, they still subvert the teacher-student romanticization and they expose it for the gross, predatory, and illegal relationship that it is. I also think it's important to note that since the actors playing the students are close in age to the actors playing the teachers, it's easy to forget how damaging and imbalanced these relationships are. These sort of relationships are severely damaging to the well-being of children and teenagers, even if the on-screen representations don't fully explore that. As always, it's important to critically engage with the media that we watch. I'm not championing the cancellation of Riverdale or Gossip Girl, but I am suggesting that we expect and demand better from TV networks and writers. Instead of relying on worn out, inappropriate, and gross cliches, do better.